Great, thank you very much. It's a great honor to be invited to the Saudi Arabian Cardiac Interventional Society. Thank you very much. And uh, it's the first time I've uh, been to this part of Saudi Arabia, the third time to Saudi. And it's hopefully going to be very good fun again. This is where I live in Bristol. Uh, you can see the blue sky, so very similar to here, but I just must warn you, that's pretty rare for Bristol. It was snowing when I left. Um, when we try and do CTOs, there's four approaches that we commonly use, anti-grade wire escalation, anti-grade dissection re-entry, retrograde wire escalation, which we've just seen, and retrograde dissection re-entry. I was going to focus here, and I'm not going to actually show a video, but I'm going to walk through a case a couple of times just to try and explain the technology, when and why we use it. So when we think of a strategy, we should look at the anatomy of the lesion and say, what are the chances of success? If it's a short lesion, less than 20 millimeters, our chances of just using anti-grade wire escalation is around about 70% successful. As that lesion creeps over the 20 millimeter barrier, our success with wires alone as a strategy diminishes to around about 30%. We need dissection re-entry type techniques, either retrograde or anti-grade, to complete the case. That also is true with the complexity of the lesion. So as our JCTO score goes up, for example, more calcification, more tortuosity, a blunt proximal cap or previous failure, we're more likely to use dissection re-entry techniques rather than anti-grade wire escalation. Here's just another example of that in a slightly different format. This is where we tend to use anti-grade dissection re-entry in more complex cases, and we tend to reserve retrograde depending on the anatomy and the suitability of the channels for the most complex cases. When we look at our own data in the UK, this would be our initial strategy, which is predominantly anti-grade wire escalation. But our final strategy, you can see, starts to use retrograde dissection re-entry in around about a quarter of cases. So it's not a panacea for all cases, it's there and it's useful for about a quarter. So when we look at lesions that are suitable, what are we looking for specifically? Well, we want to look at the proximal cap and say, is it ambiguous or not? How long is our lesion? What is the quality of the landing zone? Is there a good target to re-enter? Are there major bifurcations or side branches? We know we don't want to lose one of those. And what is our own skill set? Are we better at doing retrograde? What are the collaterals like? Can we do that in an easier, more efficient fashion than anti-grade dissection re-entry? We've also got to realize a few basic fundamentals. However careful we think we are, we quite commonly go sub-intimal. So even if we think we're wiring the intimal space, our wires on IVUS will go into the sub-intimal space. There's also a risk when we're using wires as a sole technique that we call per cause perforations. And this is in short lesions. 26% of these cases in this registry or 50 um, patients done in Japan had IVUS evidence of coronary perforation. So what we believe is that actually using the sub-intimal space is relatively safe where we use a knuckle wire to traverse a long lesion. And the reason behind this is the physiology. We know that the media and intimal layers are relatively weak compared to the adventitial layers, which has three times the radial and longitudinal strength of the other two layers. It's also efficient. We know that as our complexity increases, the chances of getting the wire into the distal bed takes longer and longer. However, our own registry data shows that as our JCTO score is in the complex range greater than three, we're able to get a wire into the distal vessel in 30% of cases within 30 minutes, compared to with the JCTO registry using predominantly a wire-based te te wire technique where only 15% of cases were able to get the wire into the distal bed that quickly. The knuckle wire is not new. Colombo first started using it, described it with the STAR technique. It was refined by Craig Thompson with the LAST technique. And Bridgepoint uh, was the first iteration of the medical system of the Cross Boston Stingray, which started in around about 2010 stroke 11, and has obviously been uh, uh, reiterated by Boston Scientific. So the equipment we use 
This is the crossboss. It's actually on a wire here. It doesn't need to be a wire. It's a one millimeter uh, blunt burr, which blunt the sex, much like a surgeon will use his uh, fingers and knuckles to stay within tissue planes, rather than a knife, which is like a sharp wire, which will cross in and out of planes. And this is the stingray balloon and wire. And you can see that at the bottom here, let me just use this. That's not gonna work. Not to worry. At the bottom, you can see here, there's two ports. One is on one side of the balloon and one is on the other side. And this is the stingray wire, which has a barb. And the advantage of this is that the balloon wraps around the artery when we inflate it, allows us to orientate which side the vessel is and to stick in one way or the other, depending which side the distal entry point is. Here's a cartoon. This shows the cross boss, and well, it's a bit of a cheat, this cartoon, but the cross boss is entering into the subinterval space. We park a Miracle 12 wire, which just supports the delivery of the Stingray system. When the Stingray is in place in the distal vessel, at the point of where we want to re-enter, and this is the specific thing about the Stingray, we can choose the re-entry point. We inflate the balloon, and this wraps around the artery. And then we can bring our wire down under fluoroscopy and select our point depending on which way the wire goes. That's obviously the wrong one. We can bring it down, rotate it, and as it comes out, push into our re-entry position. You feel a very distinctive pop when this occurs. So I'll just walk you through a standard case. This was a JCTO2, a relatively simple, straightforward case, but it had been failed before. It's a long lesion. We bring the crossbus down and you can see there's no wire and all we do is spin it in the subinterval space. We make sure it's dancing with the vessel so it's within the architecture. You can see it's in an ideal position now to re-enter. We inflate our crossbus balloon and what you don't want to see is the two balloons side by side. What you want to do is have them aligned. And you can see them just here aligned with the two dots of the exit port. We inject from the contralateral side to show which side the vessel is. It's to the right of the stingray. We bring our stingray wire down and punch you into that. And then we swap out to a Pilot 200 to follow that track that's been created by the stingray wire. This is just an, um, I'll skip that. And we complete the case. So as we're teaching this process, entering the subinterval space seems to be a bit of a stumbling block. We tend to do that sometimes by mistake. We see our wires going to the subinterval space. But sometimes when we have very blunt caps, it's a real challenge. What I tend to do would be bring a Corsair down on a stiff wire, for example, a Confianza Pro 12, punch it into the proximal cap, deliver my Corsair, and then take something like a Fielder XTR or a Pilot 200 to create a knuckle and then we push this when we have tape caps as opposed to a, a um, blunt cap the cross boss can be used solely on its own these are the two wires that we tend to use as knuckle wires a filter xtr or a pilot 200 they're different attributes the xtr has a much smaller knuckle the pilot 200 has a much larger knuckle and allows you to steer around side branches and what the knuckle does, it allows you to deal with resistant uh, lesions and negotiate side branches. So I think earlier we were talking about how do we get past calcified lesions or deliver equipment. We sometimes just go around them. Here's a demonstration of a knuckle wire being delivered out through a cross boss. And we just push that. And you can see how quickly we can traverse that subinterval space. It takes seconds. This is real time and we're then able to deliver the cross boss into the subinterval space. It also allows us to resolve quite marked tortuosity, and I think in that last case, the retrograde case, an opportunity would have been able to knuckle retrograde and anti-grade to deal with the ambiguity that was there and to deal with it safely. The reason we need a cross boss, however, is to keep the subinterval space small. And here on the left is where we use the knuckle, and on the right, a cross boss. We then freeze those frames. The subinterval space is large when we use a knuckle. 
uh, and the true lumen is small, making it a small, difficult target to re-enter. Whereas when we use a cross boss, the sub-interval space is kept small, maintaining good size of the true lumen, making it an easy entry. So one more case, cross boss ready to be delivered, having taken a knuckle wire, we deliver that cross boss to where we want to, want to re-enter. Bring our stingray down, and you can see here I've lost a little bit of distal visualization. So what I'm going to do is just remove my wire that supported delivery of the stingray and suck back on the distal port. You see here now I'm getting better visualization, sorry, on this one. And you can see my re-entry position is to the right. So I will stick with my stingray wire, but it's a tortuous vessel. I don't want to take that too far because there's a chance that that wire could cause further dissection and trouble distally. So I swap onto a Pilot 200, re-enter that tract, and it takes a little bit of time, this. And I'm being quite careful. And once I feel it going freely, I can then advance it into the distal bed and complete the case. So we had to be careful with our subinterval space. We know that we can easily fill that with contrast. What we also know is that hydrostatic pressure is very easy and can very easily fill the subinterval space, allowing us to lose visualization. And the reason for this is that the arterial pressure is 80 millimeters of mercury from the aorta, and from our collaterals is normally only 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury. So anatomical risk factors for loss of the distal bed is when we have a high dependency on ipsilateral collaterals, we've got small diseased distal vessels or poor collateral filling. Procedural related factors that allow loss of distal bed is when we use a large knuckle. We get propagation of our distal wire so we're not controlling our wire position and we're quite adamant when we go and teach and proctor uh, how to do the stingray case that uh, wire hygiene is important. And anti-grade or microcatheter guide injection we frown upon. Here's where an injection in the anti-grade guide has obviously caused a large dissection and loss of distal filling. So how do we deal with this? Well, we can use a blind stick, we can use Ivis re-entry, both of those are very difficult. We can attempt to re-enter more distally, but we may lose side branches. We may just discontinue that procedure and come back six weeks later to uh, re-attempt. Or we use the straw technique when we either put a balloon down the side next to the stingray to decompress the hematoma, or we just suck back on the distal port, relieving the pressure within the subintimal space, allowing better visualization and an easier re-entry. So rules for working in the subintimal space, no anti-grade injection, no microcatheter injections, control your knuckle, meticulous the control of position during exchange using the trapping balloon technique, use the cross post catheter as much as you can to keep the subintimal space small, and control the inflow of the subintimal space as well. No anti-grade injections, obviously. ADR, I'm just going to show you a few more complex cases, can be used in JCTO 4, 5, etc. cases. Here's a uh, blunt proximal cap, which is very calcified. There's tortuosity and has previously been failed. The problem in this case was the proximal cap. And uh, different techniques for trying to tackle that, and this was mentioned earlier, where again with calcified proximal caps, we use balloon anchoring techniques, side vessel, coaxial main vessel, anchor tornus. We use deliberate balloon rupture or Carlino um, uh, um, technique where we inject very small amounts into uh, a microcatheter in the uh, body of the occlusion. We can use what we call a scratch and go where you go into the subintimal space early or potentially we can use rotablation in the subintimal space. In this case, we were able to puncture the proximal cap with a Confianza Pro 12, deliver our Corsair, and then was able to swap it out for a Fielder XT. We then tried to deliver our crossboss catheter, but we were unable to deliver that, or an anchor, tornus. Balloon rupture was tried, uh, and coaxial main balloon anchor was also tried to uh, deliver all our equipment. However, we did have a wire in place and we swapped that out to a rotor wire and here's rotablation in the subintimal space with a 1.25 millimeter burr. 
It is allowed, but carefully. We were then able to deliver the knuckle wire into the distal vessel, our crossboss into the position where we wanted to take our stingray balloon, our stingray balloon into the position where we wanted to re-enter. Re-entry occurred and we were able to complete the case. Osteo lesions tend to be the remit of retrograde um, only. Just play this one. The problem is retrograde depends on collateral channels, and we know that a good number of cases won't have suitable channels for us to recross. So we deliver our microcatheter into the proximal vessel using a, a stiff wire and taking that just a few millimeters. We then inject contrast at high pressure with a two millimeter lower lock uh, syringe. We can then introduce a knuckle wire into the subintimal space. And you can see that here, which allows us to define our anatomy and make sure that we're within the architecture of the vessel. I've taken that quite a long way to support the delivery then of our cross boss, which we then take into a position where we can re-enter. You can see there's quite a lot of calcium in this vessel. We stick, swap, and complete the case. So just in summary, anti-grade dissection re-entry is teachable, is certainly safe, can be very efficient and effective way of delivering CTO PCI in a population of patients where we had previously failed. And I'll just do a little plug for our course in Europe and Amsterdam this year, where we've got a lot of world-class renowned interventionists, and there's a very good teaching program associated with this, not just anti-grade dissection re-entry, but the whole field of CTO PCI. Thank you very much.